Hello and welcome to Breaking Down Bad Books, a podcast analysing trashy bestsellers from a literary perspective. And today we're looking at chapter 13 of 365 Days. So where we left off, we met her best friend Olga, who is just a wild ride. Never met anyone like her. And they had a little shopping spree. She bumped into Makale. And now they're back in her new fancy apartment. And she starts this chapter saying, when we woke up the next morning and got ourselves more or less in order, I felt surprisingly good. So I'm taking that to mean she's cheering up. Because remember, she's in Poland now and she's not really that happy about it. Because Massimo is either dead or faked his death or is on the run. Even though when she had heart surgery, he did come and sit by her bedside, but we're acting like that's a dream because it was in italics, so we're not sure if it happened. Even though everyone's referring to the heart surgery, so it sort of feels like it's happened, but then we forget about the heart surgery, so it does sort of feel like it's forgotten about. So it's all up in the air. But at this point, she's saying, I have to live my life. I need to forget about the weeks I had spent in Italy. So she's referring to it as weeks because I'm also confused on where we are at with the timeline. But she's trying to have fun. So she says to Olga, you know what? I think I want to have some real fun today. Do we have a hairdresser set for today? Because they're going to a spa. And Olga's like, uh, please. Do you think I know how to do my hair on my own? Sure we have. Okay, they're going to a spa and they're getting their hair done. And it says, Olga said this with a laugh as I locked the door. There's a lot of emphasis on locking the door in this chapter. So she says going to a spa is one of the rituals her and Olga indulged in once every so often. Because remember, they're best friends, even though we've never heard about her until page 300. And she says peels, massages, facials, nails, hairdresser, and finally makeup. Peels, massages, facials, nails, hairdresser, and finally makeup. I don't know why hairdresser is the only occupation and everything else are just things you get done to yourself. I don't know why she didn't just say hair, but hairdresser and finally makeup. And apparently that's the order they do it in because she says when the time came for the penultimate point on our list, penultimate point, that sounds like a book from Lemony Snicket's series of unfortunate events. (laughs) The penultimate point. I miss those books. Did anyone else like those books? I liked them. Although I was so frustrated because they never really ever went anywhere. And I know he wanted to write like 13 of them because that's an unlucky number, but it's just like, bitch, get to the point, Lemony. And so her hairstylist is called Magda because we're in Poland now, so everyone's called Olga Magda. (laughs) And she says, what are we going to do for you, Laura? And she says, blonde. And Olga jumps out of her chair because she's like, what? Laura's going blonde. Did we know what Laura's hair color was? If we did, I'm not aware of it. And she says she wants, oh God, she wants a bob with the back shorter and the front a bit longer. So I guess she wants that punk look. And Olga is shocked. She says, what? Are you out of your fucking mind? You've gone crazy. And I'd say she's overreacting. But if one of my friends said, hey, I want to go blonde and I want a bob with the back shorter than the front, I'd be like, what are you out of your fucking mind? You've gone crazy. So yeah, very relatable Olga. And Olga's doing some real pantomime work here because Magda, she says, yeah, that's fine. Let's do it. And Olga collapses into her chair, shaking her head with disbelief. It's like, okay, Olga, you're really doing a lot of dramatic work here. The world's her stage. Oh, and then she says, because her desire to get a haircut will cause a delay, the makeup artists, plural, arrived and immediately went to work because they're like, oh, we don't have enough time. We've got to do their makeup while they get the haircut, which doesn't seem practical. Every time I've gotten my haircut, you end up with little bits of hair stuck in your face and your stylist needs to get a little brush and and brush the little hair off of your face, but they're they're getting makeup done at the same time. Honestly, the way they're carrying on, it's reminding me of that Miss Congeniality scene, you know, where she's getting the makeover and her stylist guy is like, eyebrows, there should be two. And he's not letting her eat like a Subway sandwich. God, what a great film. So after two hours, her hair gets done and she says it was breathtaking. 
The color of ripe wheat complemented my sun-kissed skin and black eyes perfectly. I looked young, fresh, and tasty. Yep, nothing says tasty like ripe wheat. (laughs) And Olga stood oogling her. Oh, God. She's so unintentionally funny, this Blanca, the way she writes. Olga stood behind me, oogling me. (laughs) And Olga's like, all right, I was wrong. You look fucking awesome. Now, come on, we have a party to go to. So they go home. She says, we parked at my apartment's underground garage and took the elevator upstairs. I pushed the key into the lock and turned it. I turned it twice, though I remembered locking it with only run rotation. And reading this, I'm thinking, okay, who gives a shit? Who gives a shit? So you're unlocking the door to your apartment as you enter it. Yes, that's, that's what would happen. But clearly we must be focusing on this because Massimo must have a key to a house or someone's been in a house and the door wasn't locked or some bullshit. Like, okay. So moral of the story, she unlocks the door. And then she says, after having a bottle of wine and changing into something less comfortable, we looked at ourselves in the mirror. We were ready. God, these girls love a pregame. And then wait till you hear what they wore. Okay, so she says, I picked a sexy black set. A high waist pencil skirt with a tightly fitting long sleeve short top. I left a two inch gap between the top and the skirt, subtly exhibiting my stomach muscles. Yet nothing subtle about it, love. And Olga decided to emphasize her natural assets. And you know how like most books would say like, oh, her natural assets and leave it at that because we all know what you're talking about. But not Blanca. Blanca's like, Dash, large breasts and beautiful full hips, dash, by putting on a snug nude dress. Oh, thank you for clarifying what her natural assets are. We couldn't have pictured it ourselves, but nope, she's got big breasts and big hips. And she's also wearing high heels, a clutch bag, and some gold accessories, because of course she is. And Olga says, the night is ours. Just keep an eye on me. I'd like to return home with you. And I'm thinking, okay, great. Gal's going to stick together. Let's see if it happens. And so they get into a taxi and go down to one of their favorite venues downtown, The Ritual, 12 Mazowika Street. Blanca, do we need to know the street number? You're writing fiction here. It's not a travel guide. And there's apparently a hundred people queuing outside the club, but Olga, she knows everyone in town. So she just walks past the line and kisses the, the woman standing guard at the entrance and they get let in. And then they're greeted by people putting VIP armbands on their wrists. So VIP armbands on wrists. I'd call it a wristband, uh, but she's, she's got an armband on her wrist. And Laura is like, drinks are on me. And she's waving around Domenico's credit card. And what does she order? A bottle of Moe Rosé. Of course she does. And Olga's like, what are we toasting to? And she says, us, which is misleading because Olga's like, ah, we're toasting our friendship. But then, (laughs) but then Laura in narration comes out and says, I wasn't drinking to me or to Olga. It was Massimo I was thinking about and the 365 days that had never happened. So she's upset that she's not kidnapped. So then she goes to the dance floor. She does some dancing, but her gorgeous shoes weren't exactly comfortable. So after three songs, she has to go and sit back down. We're always hearing about how her shoes aren't comfortable. Just wear flats. Just wear flats. And then she feels a hand on her shoulder and she turns around and it's Martin, her ex. And he's like, where have you been? Can we talk? But all she can think about are the photos Massimo showed her where he was cheating on her. And she's like, I have nothing to say to you. And he's like, come on, Laura. And she's back to her champagne glass. She's smashing that champagne and that's making her feel stronger. And she's like, you can't tell me anything I don't already know. She's so mad that this guy moved on after she dumped him. I mean, yeah, it happened in the space of like two hours, but still. And she thinks, well, despite all the anger and revulsion I had felt after seeing those photos, I decided he deserved an opportunity to tell me his version of events. So she's like, all right, talk to me, but not here. Wait a minute. 
And so she goes down to the dance floor, catches Olga. And Olga's not surprised or angry. She had already managed to find a replacement for me in the form of a charming blonde haired man. And Olga says, go. I don't think I'm coming back tonight. So don't wait up. Olga, you just said when you were leaving the apartment that you were coming back here tonight. Keep an eye on me. Don't let me ditch you. But now she's ditching her. And she's saying, all right, Martin, let's go and have a chat. But Laura, why do you have to leave the club? You're not that interested in him. You want to hear his version of events. Uh, uh, Let him talk to you at the club. Why do you need to go and have a powwow? And so he drives her across the city to his apartment. And okay, Laura, you totally missed the opportunity here. The game plan is you save an Uber fare and you get him to take you to your apartment on your territory and you get a free lift home. What's this him taking you to his apartment thing? That's totally not what you wanna be doing in this situation. And so she says they get to the door of his apartment and she nearly faints because even this place, not once seen by the man in black, reminded her of Massimo. But she doesn't, she doesn't really elaborate. So. So I guess the implication is that his like decor reminds her of Massimo, but also this was your boyfriend. Surely you know what his place looks like. Why are you fainting when you're at the door to his apartment? Also, she's at the door to his apartment. She hasn't even opened the door yet. So I don't know what this rush of feelings is. She's a very complicated character. And by complicated, I mean, she's written like trash. So she sits down on the couch and she's feeling uncomfortable because she feels like she's acting against the will of Massimo, breaking his ban by seeing Martin. And Martin's like, all right, here's the story. When you ran away, I realized you were right. So I went after you, but one of the hotel staff stopped me at reception saying there was a serious malfunction of something in our room and that they needed my key to get inside. Okay, Martin, you're gullible because that sounds like BS. The hotel staff already have keys to every room. Like, how do you think housekeeping works? They didn't need to stop you and ask for your key if there was a serious malfunction. Also, wouldn't you be like, what malfunction? What's going on? And he says that turned out there was only an error in the alarm system and that everything was fine. What? Why would you, why would you come back and check on this when you were chasing after your girlfriend who's upset? Why is this false alarm a priority? And he's like, but then I went and chased after you and I thought you wouldn't have gone far. That's why I didn't have my phone on me because I thought I'd just catch up with you. But then when I got back to the room and finally called you, that's when I saw the letter in the room and you were saying all these things, which all sounds very convenient. Especially when we know Laura was just sitting in some cafeteria having a tiramisu. So what does Martin do? He calls reception and orders drinks to the room. (laughs) But, and he doesn't know if it's because of the hangover or from all of the worrying, But after the first drink, he felt drunk. And he says, believe it or not, I don't remember anything else. And then the next day, Carolina, she told me what I did. And then when I thought it couldn't get any worse, reception told us we had to leave the hotel because our credit cards bounced. So we left the island. That whole vacation was cursed. So, okay, takeaway, he got drugged, right? That's pretty obvious to everyone. He got drugged. I wonder if it will be obvious to Laura. And she sort of does see how Massimo could have played a part in everything that happened. And she says, I wasn't sure who I was angrier with, the man in black for engineering this farce or Martin for allowing himself to be mixed up in it. I mean, is it really Martin's fault? It seems like you're the, you're the person who brought Martin into this. I mean, it's not your fault either. Don't want to put the blame on you, Laura, but also like, how's it Martin's fault? But Laura's like, well, you know what? You still slept with that bitch. And he's like, oh, Laura, you're so right. I'm so sorry. I don't want to lose you. I'll do anything to prove to you that I can change. And then she starts to feel the champagne rising in her throat. And she's like, oh, I don't feel so good. So she gets up, runs to the bathroom and starts vomiting. And I was thinking like, she hasn't had that much to drink. Why is she vomiting? But then she says, I was sick of that day and that conversation. So the conversation made her sick. Blanca is nothing if not literal. And then she's like, I want to go home. And Martin's like, all right, let me drive you. (laughs) You should have just driven her home in the first place. I don't know why you had to stop off at your apartment. That's crazy. So she's given him directions to her place and they get to her apartment. And so she gets to the front door and she says, it's here. I said, pushing the key into the lock. 
more key into the lock business. And she's like, okay, bye. And as soon as she opens the door, he tried slipping inside with her. And she's like, what the fuck are you doing? Don't you get it? I don't want you around anymore. You said what you wanted. Now leave me alone. And she's trying to close the door, but Martin's stopping it. And he's like, I miss you. Let me in. And she's like, Martin, God damn it. I'll call security. And then she notices that he's staring at something behind her. And she turns around and her heart nearly bursts. And again, this is Blanca. That could be literal. She does have a heart condition. And then Massimo's there. He's rising from the couch and walking towards the door. So Massimo's alive. And he says, I assume in English, uh, I can't understand a word of what you're saying, but Laura seems to want you out of here. And then he says, should I repeat it to you so that you understand? Maybe you'll get it in English. Like I get what he's saying, but also you just told me you don't know what Laura's saying. But now you're like, let me repeat it in English. Well, how are you going to translate it when you don't know what, what she said? Because she's speaking in Polish. And so Martin's like, all right, see you around, Laura. Let's keep in touch. And then he leaves. And so as soon as he leaves, the man in black and her are just staring at each other. Seems like for a long time. She says, here he was alive and well. For a long while, we stood like that, staring at each other. The tension was unbearable. And then she says, where the fuck have you been? (laughs) And then she slaps him in the face. And she says, do you have any idea what I've been through? Like, what has she been through? I mean, she had heart surgery. I'll give her that. But then she just moved back to Poland, had a really nice apartment. You know, a jacuzzi on the terrace. Nice new car, visited her parents. Sounds like she had a great time. And she's like, you think I love feigning out of fear every fucking day? How could you leave me like that? Jesus. And then she collapses onto the floor. And he says, you look breathtaking, baby girl. Love your haircut. (laughs) It's just, I wish I was making that up. And she's like, don't touch me. Explain yourself right now. But she's also thinking, God, he's beautiful. He looks more beautiful than I remembered. He's wearing dark pants and a dark long sleeve shirt, emphasizing his perfectly toned body. Because nothing emphasizes a body like a dark long sleeve shirt. And she says, even now, furious at him, I couldn't not notice how extremely attractive he was. I couldn't not notice. I'd say that's a double negative, but there's a lot of negatives in this book. So then Massimo pounces and grabs her and like puts her over his shoulder, which is his go-to move, just carrying her reluctantly from room to room. That's his thing. And then he's throwing her on the bed and pressing his body against her. And he's like, you met with him even though I told you you weren't permitted to. You know that I'll kill this man just to make him stop seeing you. (sighs) At least he complimented her hair first before going straight to the threats and controlling behavior. Like at least we got a compliment of the haircut. Because if I got a a blonde bob and my my boyfriend who I thought was dead and isn't actually dead and he came back from the dead and he didn't acknowledge my haircut, I'd be like, notice anything different? And then he's brutally pushing his tongue into her mouth and she wants to shove him away. But as soon as she felt the taste and his scent, all the days she spent without him flashed before her eyes. And she says, 16. No, she whispers that without breaking the kiss. So I assume she's talking into his mouth, like, And he's like, huh? And she says, 16, that's how many days you owe me, Don Massimo. So he's only been gone 16 days. She's been carrying on like a pork chop, like it's been months and months and months, but it's been 16 days. And so he takes his shirt off and she can see his naked chest with fresh wounds, some still with bandages on them. And she's like, oh my God, Massimo, what happened? And he's like, I'll tell you everything, but not today. I need you to be well rested, fed, and above all, sober. You're very thin, Laura. So I can't help but feel like he's negging her. But he says, all right, let's get you out of those clothes. And so he rolls her over onto her belly and then unzips her skirt, pulling it down her thighs and throwing it onto the floor. And then he does the same with her top, leaving her in her lace underwear. This is so not romantic. And he says, oh, this is a new set. I don't like it. You should take it off. So he doesn't like her lace undies. (laughs) I thought he loved lace. All he picked out for at Victoria's Secret were lace, except for that one pair of cotton panties. 
And then she says, for the first time, I saw his manhood when it wasn't erect yet. His thick, heavy cock was slowly rising as I got rid of my underwear. So it is getting erect. Um, But she says, even in this form, it was wonderful. (laughs) Even in this form. Oh, my goodness. So then she's naked and she says, come to me while spreading her legs. And he's kissing her all over. And then he's doing other stuff to her. And she's digging her nails into his back all the way to his buttocks, leaving trails of red. This man has open wounds on his chest and bandaged wounds. And they're engaging in strenuous sexual activity, which seems ill-advised. And now to top it all off, she's creating more wounds on the other side of his body. So she's just tearing his back apart. But apparently he's into it because the pain she caused him was the final straw. His hot seed spilled inside her. And she's so relieved and she's crying and he's like, oh, baby girl, what's going on? But she doesn't want to talk about it. So she rolls over, they hug, she falls asleep. And then the most horrific little wake up call happens. She opens her eyes and jumps to her feet screaming because the sheets were all blood spattered and Massimo was deathly still. Yeah, because he had all these open wounds, plus you tore his back to shreds. And she's like, Massimo, and she's crying and rolling him over. I guess she thinks he might be dead, but <laughs> but then he opens his eyes and she's like, oh, and then she collapses. And then he like wipes away the blood from his torso and he's like, oh, it's nothing. The stitches must have come undone. And he's like, oh, but we better get cleaned up. We look like we've murdered someone. And she's like, oh, that's not funny. And so she goes to the bathroom. He joins her. She washes him gently, stripping off the blooded patches. And then she, you know, applies new bandages. And she says, you need to see a doctor. And he says, I'll do what I want, but first we need to have breakfast. Your fasting has come to an end. Remember, because she's skinny. She's skinny and he doesn't like it. So he needs stitches. And she's just put a few band-aids on him. And I, I guess that's sufficient for him to be gallivanting around the kitchen. Massimo's looking into the fridge and there's only wine, water and various juices. <laughs> God, what a floozy. It's been 16 days. Maybe you could have filled up the fridge. And she says, I haven't been hungry lately, but there's a grocery store downstairs. Go get us something to eat. I'll make you a list and prepare breakfast. And Massimo's like, what? Like do the grocery shopping? And she's like, yes, Don Massimo, groceries. Butter, bread, bacon and eggs, breakfast. And he's like, okay, then write me a list. And then she's given him directions to reach the store, which is located in the same building, about a dozen feet from the main entrance. So how he needs directions to the grocery store that's downstairs, I don't know. But also ballsy of you, Laura, to send the man who's bleeding. He's got these chest wounds that need re-stitching. And you've just whacked a bandage on and you're sending him to go and run errands. You're writing him a grocery list and sending him off to go and do the hard work. Why don't you go? Why don't you go? Why are you sending the sick man? I mean, I know it's just downstairs. It's not a big trek, but you could have gone together. You could have just popped down just as easily. It's downstairs. So why did she do this? I'm going to give you a second. Think to yourself, why has Laura sent Massimo downstairs to buy herself some time. Have you thought of something? Okay, let let me tell you. It's so she can go and put makeup on. (laughs) She says she rushed to the bathroom, combing her hair, applying quick makeup. One of those, I have no makeup on, that's just how I look every morning things. (sighs) Which is understandable. But then she says, I put on a tracksuit and sat on the couch. So you go on all this effort to put makeup on and then she's, whacking a tracksuit on top of it. Also, he's seen you already. I think that I have no makeup on thing only works while they're still asleep. Not after you've had a shower together, you've written him a grocery list, you've you've given him directions to the grocery store. It doesn't really work when he's awake. And it especially doesn't work when you then put on a pair of trackies. And then Massimo comes back quicker than she thought. And he also didn't use the intercom. And she's like, when did you get to Poland? And he's like, breakfast first, Laura, then we can have a chat. So she cooks the breakfast, then they sit down and she's like, all right, Massimo, I've waited long enough. Talk, exclamation mark. And he's like, all right, ask away. And she says, how long have you been in Poland? And he says, since yesterday morning. And she says, have you been here while I was out? And he says, yeah, when you left with Olga around three in the afternoon. And she's like, how do you know the code? And how many keys are there to this apartment? 
this apartment that he bought and gave her the key to with a preset code. Like, okay, oh, how does he know the code? And he's like, oh, I came up with the code. It's my year of birth, which if she knew anything about him, she could have put two and two together with that one. But I guess she doesn't know his year of birth. And she actually muses on it. And she's like, huh, 1986. He was only 32. So I don't think she knew how old he was. And then she's like, have I been watched? And he's like, well, fucking dar. And she's like, yeah, I kind of suspected. And she's like, were people following me yesterday? And he's like, no, I was following you yesterday. So he says, I've been to all those places, including your ex-boyfriend's apartment. I can tell you this. When you got into his car at the club, I was close to shooting the guy dead. He was there the whole time, but still managed to race her back to the apartment before she entered the apartment with Martin. Why didn't he just go up and say hi there? And then uh, uh, you go to all this effort to stalk someone and you just watch from the shadows. It doesn't make sense. And Massimo's like, let's clear something up. Either you stop seeing him or I get rid of him. And then she says, oh, hours of training on how to manipulate people didn't go to waste. I knew how to spin this. So was her, was her job about manipulating people? I thought she worked in hotels. I thought she worked for like a hotel chain in like acquisitions, like setting up new franchises. But, but no, she's, she's been training for hours on how to manipulate people. In the hotel business. Okay, sure. And so she's, I guess, trying to save Martin's life for being like, you see him as a rival? I didn't think you'd think of him as any competition. And by golly gosh, it works. And he goes, you know what, Laura? You're right. I can accept an argument if it's rational. And she's like, great. Martin means nothing to me. So let's just let let him live and forget all about him. And she says, but while we're talking about him, what did you put into his drink on my birthday? And he's like, uh... And she goes, what, you thought I wouldn't find out? (laughs) They just had a chat about it. Massimo was apparently there watching and listening in, so I don't know why he's shocked. And he says, oh, it wasn't a roofie or MDMA. It was just something that made the alcohol work faster. We only wanted him to get drunk quicker than normal. What is this drug? (laughs) I mean, what is this drug? Was it absinthe? It must have been absinthe. I don't know. And he's like, well, you know, it, it is what it is. I mean, would you have really liked the whole thing to be played out differently? Like, I will change for you, but I'm not going to change for anybody else. If I want something, I get it. I would have kidnapped you that day or some other one. It was just a matter of time and method. Which, wow, what a sweet talker. And she's starting to get angry, but then he says, you really want to dwell on the past? We can't change it now. And you can tell he's sort of like shrugging, being like, it is what it is. And she goes, "Ah, oh, you're right. All these hours of training at manipulation, but she gives up pretty quick in an argument. And then she's like, well, what happened in Naples? The TV said you were dead. And then Massimo gives us the most far-fetched little story. He's like, well, I left our hotel room and went to reception and I spotted Anna stepping into the car of her half-brother, Don Emilio. Emilio is the head of the family in Naples. And I knew Anna was up to no good after what she said. So I knew I had to leave you because she wasn't expecting that. And if she wanted to get you by going after me, I needed to mess up her plan. So I got back to the yacht and went to Sicily from there. And I ordered one of the women from the staff at the Titan to join me. And she put on your clothes and went home with me to Sicily. So he's essentially put this poor staff member's life at risk because he's acknowledging that Anna wanted to kill Laura. So he got some other poor bitch to dress up in Laura's clothes. (laughs) And then he says, I had been planning to meet Emilio for weeks. So we went to Naples to go and do business. And Laura's just accepting all of this bull crap as it comes out of his mouth. And he's like, yeah, I was dating his sister because I thought, you know, two major mafia families It would guarantee peace for a long time, not to mention total dominance in most of Italy. It's very Game of Thrones marrying off a Lannister with a Baratheon to, you know, solidify the crown. So he goes to this meeting with Emilio and Anna knew about it. And so he goes with Mario and several other people who he ordered to stay in their cars. And the negotiations didn't go so well. And Emilio's yelling at him saying, you disrespected my sister, you made her abort her unborn child. And then he said, vendetta. 
And she's like, oh, Vendetta? Isn't that only a thing in the movies? And he says, unfortunately not. <laughs> uh, uh, this is the dumbest book. And he says, if you kill a member of a family or betray them, the entire organization is entitled to hunt you down. And he's like, the whole abortion thing was a lie, but I knew I couldn't convince him of the truth. So then he's driving to the airport, but there's two Range Rovers blocking their way. And Emilio's people stand out and there's a shootout and Emilio died. But then Massimo and Mario had to hunker down for a while and wait while it all blew over. And the TV got it wrong. The wrong mobster died. And Laura's listening to all this thinking that it was like a gangster movie. (laughs) And she says, I didn't know if with my weak heart, I'd have made a good mobster's wife. But one thing was certain. I was madly in love with the man facing me. That's the one thing that's for certain. I'd be more focusing on the weak heart that you just mentioned, but never elaborate on. And then he says, just so you know, Laura, there was no pregnancy and no unborn babies. I'm very cautious with those things. And she's like, oh yeah. And so she says, do you have a transmitter implanted under your skin? And he's like, um, and he says, yeah. And she says, show it to me. So he takes off his shirt and sticks out his left hand and jiggles the little transmitter. And then she touches the contraceptive implant, wink, wink, on her left bicep. And I guess they feel the same because she's starting to get hysterical. She says, I'll kill you, Massimo. I'm serious. How could you lie to me about something like that? And so she's starting to figure out that the transmitter is just a transmitter. It's not also a contraceptive. So there was no contraceptive implant and he's been raw dogging her with no condoms. And she's this whole time been thinking, ah, that's okay. I've got my contraceptive implant, so I won't get pregnant. So he's lied about that. And she has been vomiting a lot lately and fainting a lot lately. So we're led to sort of think that she's pregnant. And if that is the case, with the amount of moe rosé she's been drinking, this is going to be one severely deformed child. (laughs) I don't want to make light of birth defects, but she's been drinking a lot. And then he says, I'm sorry. I just thought that the easiest way to keep you with me would be if I got you pregnant. Oh boy. And... (laughs) Laura says, I knew he was being sincere, but normally it was women who played that trick on rich men, not the other way around. Which, okay, what a stereotype. Is that, a, is that really a thing or is that just like a soap opera thing? So then she grabs her bag and races out the door and she took the elevator down to the garage trying to calm her nerves. She drove to the mall not far from her apartment. Um, okay. Normally I'd think, yeah, you'd want to go and buy a pregnancy test. You'd go to the nearest mall, but you just told me there's a store, a grocery store downstairs in your apartment building. And you didn't, you didn't think, oh, I'll just check and see if they have a pregnancy test. But no, she's getting in a car and she's driving across town to a mall. Bitch, just check downstairs. Did Blanca forget that there's a grocery store downstairs? I think Blanca forgot that there's a grocery store downstairs, even though it was just introduced, but she gets a pregnancy test from the mall. Then she comes back to the apartment and she says, you barged into my life, kidnapped me, stole a year of my life. Well, it's, it's, it's only been like five weeks, not, not really a year of your life. Um, and threatened to kill me and my loved ones, but it wasn't enough for you. You just had to try and fuck things up even worse by single-handedly deciding to get me pregnant. And then she says, now, Don Massimo, I'll tell you how it's going to be. If it turns out I'm pregnant, you will leave this place and I will never be yours. And he's like, oh, wait a minute. And she says, I'm not finished. You'll see your child, but you'll never see me. The kid will never take over after you and live in Sicily. Is that clear? I'll have it and raise it, even though I don't want it. (laughs) I bet Massimo's feeling pretty sheepish right now. And he's like, well, what if you're not pregnant? And she says, then you'll have some atoning to do. So she's like, oh, if I'm not pregnant, it's fine. We can still be together. (laughs) So she says she goes to the bathroom. She gets the test and she did what was necessary. AKA she pissed on the test. I love how she, she will tell us all about him licking her out and 
the hot seed spilling into her as she's tearing her nails against his back, drawing blood. But she doesn't want to tell us that she peed on a pregnancy stick. She says, oh, I did what was necessary. It'd be uncouth of me to tell you that I peed on a stick. But all the other details she's happy to give us. But no, okay, so she did what was necessary. And then she's sitting there waiting for the results. And, and Massimo's like, Laura, is everything all right? And she says, give me a moment. And she says, Jesus Christ, dot, dot, dot. And that's the end of the chapter. So a little cliffhanger for your nerves. Wow, lots happened. Massimo came back. We thought he was dead. <laughs> no one thought he was dead. Meanwhile, he's bleeding out from the chest wounds that have not been stitched up yet. But I guess we'll have to deal with that after we deal with the pregnancy test. Can't wait to find out. Do you think she's pregnant? Do you think she might not be pregnant? I mean, she's been vomiting a lot. Let me know your theories and I'll see you next week. Bye. Send your burning thoughts, frustrations, and grievances on this latest chapter of this shitty book to breakingdownpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at podbreakingdown and Instagram at breakingdownbadbooks. You can visit www.breakingdownbadbooks.com for all the listen links, contact information, merch, and more. To support the show on Patreon and gain access to exclusive ad-free bonus episodes, visit patreon.com slash breakingdownbadbooks. Ratings and reviews on your preferred podcast platform are also a fun, free way to support the show. Breaking Down Bad Books is hosted by me, Nathan Brown, who you can follow on Instagram and Twitter at NathanBrown90. Thanks for listening and happy reading. 